Hello, my name is David Bernstein. I'm president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Thank you for being with us on this edition of the CRCast, a bi-monthly webcast for the Jewish community relations and federation world on issues concerning us, Jewish advocacy and community relations. I'm really thrilled to have uh, with us today Giddy Greenstein, who is the founder and president of Friends of Reut America. Um, and uh, the Reut Institute is a wonderful institution that's done some groundbreaking research that's informed the way we think about our work. And uh, Giddy, thank you for being that person that uh, has helped us think through the various challenges that we face, and we're really delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, David. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, with everybody else here. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Likewise. So, um, going back to 2010, the Reut Institute, under your leadership, put out this groundbreaking report. Um, it was the Delegitimization Challenge, Creating a Political Firewall. It was actually part of a trilogy of reports that came out that sort of mapped out the delegitimization challenge that we were all feeling. Can you first of all define the issue for us? What, did, what was that challenge and how did you define it at that time? So the background for that was the Second Lebanon War in 2006. During that war, which as all of us remember, it, the war began with an act of aggression by Hezbollah across an internationally recognized border into the state of Israel, abducting two soldiers into Lebanon. And then the, in the continuation of the war, we saw systematic, almost exclusive attack of Hezbollah on Israeli civilian targets. So in that circumstances, you would expect that people in the world would be more supportive of Israel. Mm -hmm. It was a side that, that was subject to aggression. But what we saw during this war, we had the road group. We saw hundreds of thousands of people in Europe taking to the streets in support of Hezbollah. So in the aftermath of the war, we were asking big fundamental questions about Israel's national security outlook. And one of the areas we were focusing on was what was happening out there that allowed these masses of people to come out and to work against Israel. And what we saw was, what we understood was that there, that in the years prior to this war, basically beginning in 2001 with the Durban conference being the crucial turning point, we saw this infrastructure, this network of institutions and organizations that was spread across Europe in key hubs, bringing together forces from the radical left and Islamic organizations. They were the, actually the heart and the core of this network. And they created this, this anti-Israel um, system that was deployed and was actually exposed during the war of 2006. So in the aftermath of the war, our team went out and, to try to understand how is it that this network was laid out in a blind spot for Israel and for most Jewish organizations. Mm -hmm. And what should we do in order to respond? And that was the beginning of the research. We went out, we traveled across Europe um, to understand that. And we met not only the, the organizations that people on the pro-Israel side, we actually went out to meet the people on the other side. And what was astonishing during that period, which could not happen now, is that they were so confident that they actually spoke to us. And they told us, we're basically going to get you. You know, and they thought they found this new way of getting at Israel. And it was kind of remarkable um, to see what they have been able to do. And that actually brought us to begin to, to articulate what could be the response. And together, the understanding of the challenge, establishing the vision, which is a political firewall that protects the fundamental legitimacy of Israel, and then articulating what we call the approach, which, which is a set of principles that allows you to deal with a challenge and to create this political firewall, that together was the document that you mentioned. Right. So you, you put out this document. You really defined the challenge for the pro-Israel world. Um, and, um, and then something happened. What happened in the Jewish world following the, your, your uh, issuing of the white paper? So basically for a few years, I'm talking about 2007, 8, and 9, until May 2010. With the exception of a few organizations, like JCRC is actually, I met the JCRC here in New York and in San Francisco and a few other organizations. For most of the Jewish community and for the government of Israel, this was in a blind spot. Mm -hmm. And that means that the leadership in Israel could not conceive of a strategic challenge of potentially long-term existential implications for Israel that was not, that did not emanate 
from a military situation, mm -hmm. from Arab armies and so on. And certainly they couldn't imagine anything that could be strategically significant that didn't emanate from states. And here in this case we're talking about a challenge that came from non-governmental organizations, from civil society. It wasn't Arab, it was in Europe. It was actually beginning to spread around the world, South Africa, a little bit in Latin America, and Australia. So all of that was so new. What happened in May 2010 was the Gaza flotilla. This flotilla, mm -hmm. Turkish flotilla that went from, from Turkey to Gaza, clashed in mid-seas, and that was the aha moment for the Israeli government. And from that moment onward, this issue became one of the top national security priorities for the government of Israel. Mm -hmm. For many Jewish organizations around the world, it also became a major concern. And from that moment onward, it wasn't us calling people and getting this, what do you guys want from us kind of response. The phone started ringing on our side. Mm -hmm. Because we became the authority on understanding the challenge, as you mentioned, and we became a source for ideas on how to deal with the challenge, which was badly needed at that moment. Right. So, uh, so you brought forth this concept, you raised awareness, um, the Jewish community started to invest resources. Did we, did we get better during that period? Did we become more organized? Did we become more of a network capable of fighting a network in the words of Reut in your yes. original so, paper? So one of the key insights that we saw was that the other side was organizing a network, mm -hmm. as a network, mm -hmm. at the time concentrated on in eight major hubs, mm -hmm. with London being the hub of hubs. So mm -hmm. one of our key efforts there was understanding what's going on in London. And we actually published a report that was dedicated exclusively to London. What, happens, what happened later is, so we were trying to, to frame a strategy that allows you to work against the network, and then we came up with this idea. It's actually not our idea. It's a famous statement. It takes a network to fight the network. And basically articulating the notion that our side, the pro-Israel mm -hmm. community, should begin to think about itself as a network, mm -hmm. operate as a network, and build its capacities as a network. And the, the, the challenge is that our alignment and the alignment of the other side is not in synchronization. And that means we may be concentrated in places like New York, we meaning the pro-Israel community, mm -hmm. places like New York or Los Angeles or Melbourne in Australia. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other side, they may be strong in Birmingham, England. Mm -hmm. or in Cape Town, mm -hmm. or in Santiago, Chile, right? So there's this misalignment between mm -hmm. where we are and where they are. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very important to be very interconnected and not allow all these small communities on our side, pro-Israel communities, to deal with the challenge on their own. Right. So what happened following 2010 is that we saw massive investment of resources, significant, dramatic improvement in capabilities. So the next question... On our part. On our part, on yeah. our side, with dramatic achievements. And I'll name three. We had no additional strategic mega event like the Gaza Flotilla. Mm -hmm. All of the mega events that came, that were attempted by the other side later on, were in one form or another subverted. Mm -hmm. A lot of it through the work of the government of Israel. Second, most BDS motions, at least in the United States of America, failed. And the third major achievement for our side was the legal in, was in the legal field. So initially, they had the upper hand with legal motions to arrest Israeli leaders and so on. But very quickly, I think our side, with very that naturally has very strong presence in the legal field, started leveraging the legal field and creating advantages that, for example, are exemplified by the legislation that have been passing in different states, mm -hmm. banning BDS, um, changing of laws even in European countries, um, using legal measures to stop government funding of supposedly human rights organizations that are actually delegitimizing organization, mm -hmm. anti-Semitically targeting Israel, mm -hmm. and so on. So we have had significant successes. Mm -hmm. But here we are, we're in 2017. Those of us who have been involved in this network battle can honestly say to ourselves, yes, we've gotten better, yet the problem hasn't gone away. 
And so Rayud Institute uh, issues a second report, the assault on Israel's gen uh, legitimacy, the frustrating 20x question, why is it still growing? A uh, report that you can actually download right here, um, right now, and we'll have it on the jcpa.org website as well. Um, so we uh, encourage you to take a look at it and read it. I think it's a really important piece of work. But it asks the, um, the question, um, why is it that we're investing 20 times more resources, we think, than, um, than Israel's attractors, yet we're losing ground? What is happening that makes that possible? And then, of course, what do we do about it? But let's start with... First of all, happening? just in terms of credit, this report was co-authored by, uh, with, with ADL. And it is based on extensive field study, which included uh, the Bay Area, Boston, New York, and Washington, plus extensive work in Israel, and working with a lot of organizations and individuals that are in South Africa and across Europe. So all of that input was crystallized into this report. And the title of the report, as you mentioned, is the 20x question. And what is the 20x question? It, it basically refers to a simple sort of guesstimate. It's not documented. Right that our community invested in 2016 20 times more resources in dealing with the challenge of the delegitimization of Israel and the BDS movement compared to 2010. And the results are still frustrating. Mm -hmm. We also know, as we just mentioned, that our side has gotten much better. So if there's so much more resources and we are so much better, how is it that we're still frustrated? And the true answer is that the other side has also gotten much better. And they are, work, they are smarter, they are much more professional, they've been able to raise more money, and they also have very significant achievements. And I would name their most significant achievement, which is the biggest challenge for us, is that they have been able to mainstream their cause, mm -hmm. which means to take their cause from the edges of the political discourse, from the edges of society, and making it a mainstream cause, primarily by being able to partner with key constituencies, and basically, um, and and through that partnership, making their vision, their agenda, which ultimately for the core group that that supports BDS and the delegitimization of Israel, that agenda is about the elimination, the negation of the right of the state of Israel to exist, mm -hmm. on the right of the Jewish people to self-determination. So, in spite of all of our efforts, mm -hmm. are getting better, more resources. They are also making progress. So we're really locked into what is called, in the strategic world, a learning competition. Right. And there's a, there's a counter thesis that I just wanted to put out there. Or maybe it's not a counter thesis. Maybe it's compatible with what you're saying. Is that in addition to the other side getting better, we're also witnessing an ideological shift in the larger environment. Um, some have said that intersectionality itself, the ideas, caught fire on campuses and elsewhere, and it's becoming a defining idea that, that uh, all uh, oppressed people face similar conditions and, and are in this fight together, and that there are, we all, each has a multiple forms of identity that can be challenged and can create compound discrimination, and that these ideas are giving fuel to uh, BDS because, uh, because the anti-Israel folks are able to say, um, that our cause is related to everybody else's cause, and either you're, if you're, if you're truly uh, facing down oppression, you're going to face down Israel and um, and, uh, and and join forces with us. Is that is that um, is that a re reasonable thesis as well? Yeah, first of all, uh, we have to appreciate that before we're talking about some people doing some sort of a demonstration in some university somewhere around the world. This is a battle of ideas. It's a clash of ideas. And their ability to frame their cause mm -hmm. in a way that allow them to strategically partner with other communities through or within this framework or within this uh, intellectual space that is created by the idea of intersectionality that allows LGBT communities to support the, uh, the anti-Israel cause in spite of their condition in Israel being so much better than anything else happening in our world around us. The fact that uh, environmental groups are able to support that. The fact that uh, um, African American groups are, are, are connecting with this cause. That is first and foremost success of ideas. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the first line of defense 
is about our ability to make a very strong progressive case for Israel. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, and this is where it actually relates to the work that you are doing in the JCPA and JCRFCs around the country. It's not just about the battle of ideas. It's also about creating or reinvigorating the authentic relationships that the Jewish community has with non-Jewish constituencies and making these relationships not just about you know, the quid pro quo, the give and take of politics. You support me, so I'll support you. It's about shared interests. Mm. Issues that matter to these communities matter to a lot of people in our community. Sure. So it's not necessarily all Jews care about these issues. But there are enough Jews that care about issues that are centrally important for other constituencies in America. And the platforms that allow that connection to come into play are the JCRCs around this country. So I always say, you know, that one of the key tests for an organization, whether an organization is relevant, is when you ask a question, if that organization didn't exist, would we need to create it? And my answer is, with regard to the JCRCs, based on all the work that we have done, for sure. If there was no JCRC, you and I would be sitting here and having a conversation about how crucially important it is to establish in every Jewish community around this country a group of people that authentically connect with non-Jewish constituencies around local issues to create the bonds and the partnerships between the two communities. And that is authentic and vital. Right. And then there'll be collateral benefits in terms of the approach to Israel and, and the right. defense of the Jewish community. So when a, when a local Jewish community or a local JCRC decides that it's going to get engaged on an issue around immigration and it builds partners with Latinos and Asian Americans, even if it's going into that work strictly on a social justice basis, that there's an ameliorative impact also on our relationship with that community and it allows us to communicate with that community on things that matter to us as well. Right, because a lot of, for a lot of these communities, genuinely, they many of them think of Jews as a religion. Religions don't have countries, don't have nations. But we know that Jews and Judaism and the Jewish people is a much more complex phenomenon. We are a religion, but we're also a people and we're a nation. And by the way, we also have a mission to humanity, to be a, you know, to serve humanity. And that complexity could only be communicated through a relationship, through an acquaintance. So we may build a relationship with non-Jewish constituency on an immigration issue, or education, or fighting poverty, or whatever it may be. But through this relationship, the other side will know the Jews, what connects Jews, is not just religion. They're dealing with Orthodox Jews, and non-Orthodox Jews, and secular Jews. What really brings Jews together is that we're a people. And the moment they recognize that we're a people, it's an easy next step to say, well, all people have the right to self-determination, and so do the Jews. And where do the Jews realize that right of self-determination? In the state of Israel. So I think that these relationships, authentic relationships built around shared passion, interest, values, are the are crucial platform for creating the philosophical defense for the idea of the state of Israel. Fascinating. So what, um, what other means do we have to, uh, both at the local level and at the national or international level, to deal with uh, delegitimization? I know you put out this idea of a long tail. Tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. So basically one of the most remarkable successes of the other side that we didn't mention earlier is that at the core of the delegitimization movement, the anti-Israel movement, it's a group of radicals. Mm -hmm. They singularly negate the right of the state of Israel to exist and the right of the Jewish people to self-determination. But let's appreciate for a moment their big idea. Mm -hmm. And their big idea was, if we go out to the world and we say, hey, let's eliminate Israel, we'll remain a marginal cause on the edges of society, illegitimate ourselves. So their idea was, let's backload our ideology, let's front load all sorts of issues where we can build coalitions around, against the security fence, around the Sheba farms, uh, uh, around the so-called blockade of Gaza and so on. Every few months there is a new issue around which they build their practical coalitions. Okay, 
And that strategy allowed them to bring on board what we call the long tail, which is a lot of people that engage in acts of boycotts, divestment, and sanction. They support local motions of these activities. They do not subscribe to the big vision. They do not subscribe to the notion that Israel should be eliminated. But they become sometimes unaware, unaware of becoming a, a tools in a much bigger, broader strategy. So in many ways, they have been successfully deploying the broad tent approach. And our argument at Preud, together with many other partners, and I know you believe it in what, as well, is that for us to be successful, we also need to have a broad tent approach. And that means that we know that, yes, you need, on the one side, you do need the heavy-hitting groups on the Jewish side that confront with the two delegitimizers and the BDS and so on. But if you want to be effective on the progressive side, you need progressive organizations that speak a progressive language that share a cause. And that way you can create an alternative agenda for that long tail of people that engage in the acts of BDS, not always being aware of what's the bigger agenda out there of the at the core of the BDS movement. So what we're saying is that we need our we need our own long tail to meet with their long tail, which means we need we need to make our diversity, diversity strategies. Yes, we need to make our diversity into an asset. And I actually believe that without that we can't win. There's no victory for us, whatever a victory would mean. There is no victory for us in the sense of marginalizing the anti-Israel movement unless we're able to work across the political spectrum. So let me just challenge one aspect of that. It's the idea of sort of delegitimizing the delegitimizer, where some groups with a more confrontational approach really, uh, really crit criticize and bring to light some of the most uh, anti-Israel voices. There's a, a counter argument there is that that can have a backlash. It seems that it's uh, meant to stifle uh, free discourse, um, and and that it it reflect it reflects poorly on the larger enterprises and the larger effort to to uh, to bring light on this issue. What is your view on that? So we, we believe that it is very important to be very clear about the definition of delegitimization. And we define delegitimization as the negation of the right of the state of Israel to exist and of the right of the Jewish people to self-determination. Mm -hmm. And we view this movement, movement as an assault on the economic, political, and defense model of the State of Israel. Now, this is a very strict, narrow definition of what is delegitimization of Israel. And it actually means that whoever on the other side qualifies as a delegitimizer, which means that they singularly negate the right of the State of Israel to exist and the right of the Jewish people to self-determination, they're basically anti-Semites. So yes, in the very, very big, broad picture, it could be the you could speak about freedom of speech and expression, but some ideas in modern society, people may have the right to express them, but they have to suffer the consequences, which means if you're being anti-Semitic, you should be marginal. There are certain things that are not said around a proper dinner table, and that's where we want to be. It also means that we have to accept that in some cases, criticism of policies of the government of Israel even harsh criticism of the policies of certain policies of one government or another government, that is not delegitimization of Israel. Yeah. And that is the kind of clarity that we need to get to on our side. Sure. Let me just riff off that for one one second. Um, you know, there there are some uh, who support what we're saying, who would um, who would oppose delegitimization, be active on it, but also argue that that what's really fueling this is not just uh, not just the other side getting stronger or changing ideological environment, but it's the Israeli government itself, which is uh, not showing any, in their view, any uh, steps forward for peace and is creating an environment that's more auspicious for the delegitimizers. What's your take on that? And what, how should that be answered? Well, first of all, if you or anybody subscribes to the notion that Israel has the right to exist, and the Jewish people has the right to self-determination. And at the same time, they criticize the government of Israel. In my book, no way they're delegitimizers. Yeah. Okay? So you can be super critical of the government of Israel, but if you stand for the idea of Israel and for the right of Israel to exist like all other nations, 
you are not a delegitimizer according to our approach. Having said that, there are people who, on the face of things, they say, yes, I'm for Israel. But really, when you scratch the surface, their only criticism is on Israel. They bash Israel. They never give Israel the benefit of doubt. They're always the first to jump on the bandwagon. And then it's hard for me to respect their argument. Mm -hmm. So if someone says that the credible and consistent commitment of the government of Israel to advancing the political process, to ending the control over the Palestinian population is essential, I subscribe to this view. Mm -hmm. But if the only side that they would point their finger at is Israel, I will have a hard time. So, and same thing, and that's a non-Jewish, non-pro-Israel. If you're on the Israel side and you say, as an Israeli, I expect my government to say more, to do more. As a Jew that supports Israel, I expect the government of Israel to do more. I recognize the faults of the Palestinian side. I recognize the fact that the Palestinians have not extended their hand, or some, some people would say rejected all the proposals that were made. Nonetheless, I expect the government of Israel to step, you know, to step forward with this politically. That, to me, is a legitimate view. But a lot of times, you know, on this spectrum of political views, it takes, you know, it's in the nose. You, you smell it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, the same argument, same identical argument from one person is legitimate and from another person is illegitimate. And a lot of it is at the tip of our fingers. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one last question here. Local Jewish communities that are watching this, that are thinking about their own strategies, can you just give a couple suggestions of what they might be able to do to, that's going to help the cause, so, both locally and the larger cause? So basically, first of all, let's speak about a few big things that need to happen. First, I think that we have to have an authentic conversation among our community defining what is the legitimization of Israel. And therefore, the subsequent question, which is, what is an act of delegitimization of Israel and what is not? This is a conversation, as basic as it is, very few communities have had. The second thing is, we really need to work hard to have a broad tent, which means we need to be able to, respect, to be respectful of our differences, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to collaborate as a pro-Israel network and community. Number three, it's a learning competition. So we can focus on all these acts of BDS and delegitimization, but really we need to go and challenge the, fu the, the fundamental layer of their network, which is the legality of their actions, their financial tools, focus on the key individuals and organizations, and so on. The fourth thing we need to do is we need to get much better at, at collecting information, analyzing trends, and therefore developing strategies that preempt the development of the you know the development of the anti-israel network and allow us to move into and to seize new spaces related to that for example is if we had in 2012 in 2011 through research would have seen the emergence of the intersectionality the trend and the idea of intersectionality we could have made investments then that would have reserved our right to play and contained the, the, the challenge of the other side. I also believe that we are probably beyond the moment of these big, mega, anti-BDS conferences. I think that was good for a while, but now we need to have what we, you know, we call for low visibility, high intensity activity. More grounding. Be because, yes, because a lot of what happened is that these big conferences actually gave them, gave the other side, uh, recognition for their success. It actually fueled them. So it was very important for a long time to raise the awareness of our community. But now people are aware. The resources are there. The people are there. They're passionate. They're concerned. Now we need a different attitude. Lower visibility and higher intensity. And the last thing I'll say is that we are actually building an asset for the Jewish community and for the state of Israel that I believe will serve us for decades to come. And that is that one of the key insights of the report that you mentioned in 2010 is that at the end of the day, all our successes are related and emanate from our ability to deploy a relationship 
that had been cultivated for a long time before. Every success, wherever you go, when you analyze what is it that made our side, the pro-Israel con contingency, successful in any location, it's always a relationship that had been cultivated and was deployed at the right time by the right people. So it's all about relationships. And our community understood that. And therefore, over the last few years, there has been multi-million dollar investment in cultivating relationships with emerging leaderships, not just across the United States, around the world. I know of groups that are bringing leaders from South Africa, of the black community in South Africa that are being brought to visits in Israel, leaders of the Christian community, interfaith groups from all over the world. And those relationships will serve us for decades. Because when you're investing in an emerging leader, age 30, 35, 40, for, you know, sometimes decades into the future, usually decades into the future, that person will be there for us. And that actually brings me back to your work, the Jewish Community Relations Council. That notion is at the heart of the work that you do. And the relationship that JCRCs are developing with non-Jewish constituencies around the country and actually around the world is vitally important. It's more relevant than ever before. Right. So we just got to do what we've always been doing, but do it more strategically, more thoughtfully, more effectively than ever before. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say more. I think that if I had a dollar to spend as a federation in, a, in the United States of America or as JFNA in the United States of America, I will have invested it in, and hopefully I'll have a lot of dollars, not just a single dollar, but the biggest untapped, one of the biggest untapped potential of our community. Remember, it's a learning competition. We have to get better, they'll get better. We'll be better, they'll be better. So where is the potential? Where will growth come from? So some people believe that growth will come by more resources being thrown in, more people parachuting in. I don't believe that. I think we are close to tapping out the resources that our community can throw into this, people-wise and money-wise. So the future growth has to come from within. And it will need to come by our ability to reinvent and recreate existing platforms, existing leadership networks. And this is where I think that, no, no offense, I think that one of the biggest untapped potentials of the Jewish community in America is the JCRC system. I'm, I'm like shocked sometimes to learn that in one community or another community, the JCRC constituency is half a person. Right. You know, no resources. Where's the technology? Where's the training? And I'm not talking about an occasional workshop here or there. I know you're doing that. I'm, I'm talking about a whole different level of investment and activities and, and so on. So for me, that's why I was so happy to be invited here because I really believe, and it's not just courtesy to you, it's in the report. By the way, co-authored by ADL. So it's not just us as I'm saying this. Right. That one of the best investments the pro-Israel community can make in America and around the world, but we're talking about America, is invest in the JCRC system. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. We agree fully. We think it's time for that of course investment. You agree. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So thank you, Gideon, very much for your insights um, and for your cheerleading as well. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we, we really appreciate your uh, tuning in. Um, our next uh, CR cast is on July 5th. It's with Marilyn Mayo from the ADL, and she's going to be talking about the emergence of the alt-right. Probably not something you knew about before the election, but know about now. So we're going to be delving deep on that. Again, please um, take a look at this report, The Assault on Israel's Legitimacy. It's on jewishpublicaffairs.org. Really appreciate that, and thank you all for being here.